Coming up on today's episode, Tesla's stock goes through the roof. There's some Model Y rumors on the way, and Tim's going to talk about his experience totally losing out to a cloud at the in-flight abort test. <laughs> Let's get ludicrous. Hey there, and welcome to Our Ludicrous Future. This is the podcast where we talk about all the cool future stuff that's happening right now that's going to make tomorrow totally ludicrous. I'm uh, Joe Scott with the Answers with Joe YouTube channel. With me is Tim Dodd. Hey, it's me, Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut, coming to you from the Gulf Coast of Florida. And with us also is Ben Solens. What's up, guys? It's Ben Solens from Teslanomics. And uh, man, nice. what a day. What a, what a day to be alive and talk mm -hmm. about things. But before we yeah. do that, we should give a big shout out to everyone on Patreon that's listening live. Yeah, we got so, some people on Discord, guys. more than normal this time. Yeah, so hello, Hi, hello everyone. If you wanna be one of those Welcome. people, you can check out the links on the Patreons and the things and hang out with us while we do it live. Because right now those people are better than you. <laughs> <laughs> so. What, so you one big- all of the the, all yeah. the flubs that we had leading up to this, like my phone's <laughs> not working, then my internet connection at this place being horrible, then a printer yeah. fiasco at the at Joe's yeah. household. So, so, so my my recording right now is at like seventeen thirty. That's how long ago <laughs> yeah. I hit record, and that's how many times we have mm -hmm. flubbed trying to get this thing started. So, yeah, nice. we're basically twenty minutes into the show. Yeah, and, and only half of that's me. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> oh man. So how is Florida? Well. Uh, you know, it was uh, it was really nice weather-wise uh, last weekend, especially around the launch. It was actually about ideal, like around 70 degrees, um, which is what, like 20 centigrade, basically. Just very <laughs> comfortable. Um, and then uh, it got down to really cold. Like, my family was at Universal Studios. That was, like, our Christmas present for my parents. Uh, they gave my sister's family and me... Uh, passes to our, you know, two day passes to Orlando or to Universal Studios. So we went to everything, but it was 45, 50 degrees the whole time. Mm -hmm. And we were, luckily we had our winter jackets and everything and it, we needed them. It was so cold. Um, so that was a little bit of a bummer, but I decided um, we were supposed to have, see a Starlink launch tomorrow. So Friday the, well, I guess today, if you guys are listening to this, Friday the 24th, but it now got pushed to Monday. And I'm just gonna stick around Florida until uh, fully charged live now since my parents have this condo here. Um, so I'm just gonna drive from here to Austin. So I will see you guys in Austin next weekend. Yeah. Drive right across yeah. the Gulf. Right, right. I'm gonna do a full Gulf tour. Hopefully it's not the same as the Bush administration's Gulf <laughs> <laughs> Mission accomplished. Tour. Yeah, well there is that, uh, <laughs> that uh, uh, submarine mode or whatever that it has, right? Right, you can, yeah. Like, clip the, the James Bond car, so maybe you should test that out. Yes. Do a little video, you know, we'll see how it works. They can do a software update that lets it drive on top of water. <laughs> it's coming. I'll just drive it right in. I'm like right at the beach, basically, so I'll just drive on into the, the water and, and see how it is. It's fine. The water's deal. fine. Yeah, so Fully Charged <laughs> Live, let's talk about that real quick because we usually only mention mm -hmm. it at the very, very end. True. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so for anyone that's never heard of it before, uh, shame on you for because not Because you listening. don't listen to our show. Yeah. Uh, you only stop at an hour and a half. <laughs> right. <laughs> February 1st and 2nd, Austin, um, which is in the state of Tejas. And I don't know exactly where it is in Austin, but it's near Austin or something. And uh, we'll be there. I think each do each one of us have our own sessions and we're doing a live podcast. I have yes. my own like answers with Joe live kind of thing and then I've got the thing with you guys and right now that's all I've got. It looks like I've been bumped from a couple of things, but I won't hold that against. And then me. our live podcast is on Saturday at 15:30. Do the military time for you guys, you know, since I'm always <laughs> cool. Uh, uh, so you can join us there, check that out, tickets, all that links, things in the things. And uh, is it going to be answers with Joe or just answer with Joe? Because I saw a different... <laughs> yeah. No, they fixed that. They fixed that? Yeah. Okay. I, I can I now thought... do multiple answers. <laughs> Let's say that, that would actually be hilarious <laughs> if it was like answer with Joe. It's just like one, the 45 minutes, you're just one answer. Yeah. You just stand and up it's a and really go, simple question. 42. I've got to like vamp for 45 minutes. Uh... Right. No, it's it's... Hello, it's me, Joe Scott. 
The answer is 42. Right. <laughs> yep. And you're out. And then just stare. Then for yeah. 40 th- <laughs> just stare. Just now we're just going to meditate. Yeah. So if you want to meet <laughs> us, you want to hang out, go check it out. Fully Charged Live. We'll be there. Mm-hmm. No, you, know, you said a second ago you didn't know exactly where it was. It's at the Circuit of the Americas, which is kind of southwest. I had to look it up myself. It's southwest of, of Austin. Southeast. 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 You're right. Sorry. I got it wrong. Southeast. Circuit of the Americas. <laughs> Put that in the in the Tom Toms and it'll take you right there. <laughs> is that still are those still out there? Do That's still, still a exist? Co- see, see we're 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 you know, pulling out the old man card. For those of us that had cars before you had a phone that had gps and google maps on it you bought a little thing and put it in your car it was called the tom tom <laughs> and you had the british male voice or the uh, australian female voice i went with the australian <laughs> female voice it was very pleasant and uh, they would they would just guide you to where you wanted to be um tom tom is still a company i don't think they sell those things anymore mm-hmm. though um, i think they make actual software and all kinds of other stuff like gps services and things like that so oh there you go there you have it well should we get first thing I learned today? Space. Let's yeah. talk about space. Speaking of GPS, which comes from satellites, mm-hmm. which come don't from they me? don't fly there on their own, you know. So uh, of course, speaking of space, we did have some uh, some a big thing happen last week, and I missed it. <laughs> this uh, this is <laughs> this was a thing. This is one of those launches, as I talked about. I just absolutely had to see because. How often do you get to go to a rocket launch knowing you're going to see a rocket blow up? Um, so that was uh, that's exactly what SpaceX was doing for their in-flight abort test. Now, as we've talked about previously, basically they were taking um, a rocket, a Falcon 9, with their crew dragon on top of it. They are taking it up to the point of maximum aerodynamic pressure. And that's right when, because don't forget, you know, rockets going faster and faster and faster in the atmosphere. But since they're going up, the atmosphere is also getting thinner and thinner and thinner. So at some point, those two things converge. And after that point, the atmospheric pressure drops. Even though the rocket's speeding up, it's no longer exerting um, a great amount of pressure onto the vehicle. So there's just that point where those two things cross, where it's going as fast as it'll be going while the atmosphere is still like, you know, tapering down, but it's speeding up and there's a point. And anyway, that's the point of maximum aerodynamic pressure. And so in order to test the system, um, if you abort during that window, that would be the most difficult time to abort and, and pull the crew module safely from that. So in other words, if you can pull away from that, you can pull away from anything really. And that's exactly what they did. And um, it was a gorgeous morning. It got scrubbed from Saturday to Sunday. Um, and that's exactly what happened. It ended up um, right at max Q, exactly as planned. They basically triggered the abort, and they had it pre-planned at a certain basic, basically at a certain velocity, that um, they would trigger an abort. Which triggering an abort actually shuts down the engines, the main Falcon 9, um, the Merlin engines. There's nine of them, and it shuts those down. Simultaneously pressurizes the Super Draco systems, with which are the abort motors, fires them up, and detaches from the upper stage, which basically. Um, you know, pulls the the crew capsule away from the now shut down and failing booster. Um, And then it it coasted up to something like 40 kilometers and pulled its parachutes and splashed down safely. So um, this is this is a shot of it here. Um, I'm just kind of going for their Twitter through their Twitter feed because they released a few more shots like this. That's really cool. This is the the moment when the you can see the engine shutting down simultaneously to the dragon engines basically firing up Um, and that happens in a uh, matter of milliseconds basically Mm -hmm. um so it's a really quick thing and that's a good thing because that needs to happen um they recovered it of course it looks great because it didn't even have to worry about uh coming back in from space you know this was just suborbital so the crew capsule really (coughs) hardly went through anything damaging it experienced only a maximum of like 3.3 g's of acceleration so not even that much acceleration it was enough to be able to pull away. And they re- even were able to recover the trunk. So the, it, the trunk actually pulls away with the Dragon capsule at first. That's the part that's below the crew capsule that's unpressurized. And that helps it stay aerodynamically stable. By staying attached to it, it has fins just like a dart and helps the, the vehicle stay pointed in the right direction. Once it's at its highest point, it will detach from the trunk too 
turn around and and enter heat shield for heat shield side down first. And the trunk doesn't, of course, have any parachutes or anything, but it was still ended up landing so softly that they ended up plucking it out of the ocean, and it looked just almost fine. You can see a few dents in it, but yeah, it's a little... shockingly, yeah, isn't that amazing? Here, I'll, I'll pull it up a little bigger. I I could not believe this. Reco I'm I can't believe this doesn't sink. Yeah, yeah. Like... <laughs> it looks like doesn't the other side like a got thing? a little bit more torn up. Than this it side, might, yeah. Still, yeah. Yeah, it probably hit. It probably hit nose first, actually, because that would make sense since the fins are near the back. You know, it probably orient itself going nose first. It looks yeah. like one of those barrels so they used cool. to have at parks when we were kids that you could go like run inside of and try to get it going really fast <laughs> and get somebody going in a circle. Yeah, and well, that's human, what's actually crazy. It, right. If if you saw a person to scale here, a, a average or like a, a tall you know fairly tall six foot human which would be what one point you know eight meters tall or whatever um would only stand up halfway in this thing because this thing's 12 feet tall mm. um so that's pretty cool <laughs> I get know. tony hawk out yes. there man who make quick work of that thing. <laughs> that'd be <laughs> awesome that'd be awesome so basically this, this test went uh flawlessly it was beautiful and i don't know if you guys saw my coverage of it but i mm -hmm. did not get to see it <laughs> so did you not even this, see the explosion um, Scott, through the clouds i did not get to see the explosion it was, it was that oh, oh that sucks dude here i will i will show you guys my replay um, this is <laughs> scott manley actually made a clip of it here on twitter this is this is me having spent for context remember i have now driven 24 hours slept uh, and, and set up equipment and, and stayed up late learning how to run this telescope, set up a whole live stream, um, done all this stuff for like multiple days basically on very little sleep. So I'm just so excited that this fi thing finally took off. We're tracking it perfectly with the telescope and here's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Hide and you're seek like champion 2020. you like setting white balance here. You got a gray card. What's happening? Right. <laughs> what are we looking at? For those who are just listening, it's just a gray screen. Like you saw a flame, like a yeah. little candle for like a second there. Oh, just ruined. Just ruined. And look at the shot. I don't know if you guys saw the um, the, the slow-mo shot that we were able to pull off with the oh, telescope. The, uh, that the takeoff? Look at, you can't even almost tell it's, it's playing. Um, it's also kind of running jerkily right now. For whatever reason, but I, uh, yeah, and I'll have a, I'll have a full video about this how we did this. We literally had a massive telescope at the press site, and we were tracking it. And I cannot believe how well it worked. And I can't wait to try it again. That's actually why I'm going to stay down here. Is we still have that telescope. We're probably just going to keep it. Mm. Um, talk to the guys at OPT Telescope about like guys, let us run this every launch. Like, <laughs> I mean, look at this footage. It the was pretty cool. Engines and everything. Yeah. Oh, very well it's done. insane. So we were able to, you know, if, if this was going to the clouds, we would have had the best shot on the Cape. What you know. What does SpaceX use for, because they seem to be able to, now obviously they have better access, right, than anyone else. But yeah. but like, do they have a, the same kind of setup, like a telescope doing that? Or like, because they're able to zoom in super good too. That's actually what the video that I'm going to do is about is pretty much like how NASA and SpaceX and all these companies track them. They have these telescopes that are basically tanks uh -huh. that a person sits in a chair and they have cameras on either side of them that are, you know, thousands of millimeters. And they literally have this joystick and the whole thing moves around. So I'm going to, wow. you know, the, the premise of the video is like, can we can we kind of do that on a, you know, mm -hmm. um, mortals scale of yeah. economy, you know, and we did we. I could not believe how good this footage came out. Like it's absolutely impressive. Like it's when when you actually see the raw footage too, because this is compressed Twitter stuff. When uh -huh. you see it, it it's unbelievable. You can see individual, you know, sheets of ice and all these little things oh, and cool. condensation pouring off. It's it's amazing. So yeah. So um, that I can was I that can mission. I can get your um, frustration when you go through that much trouble and you have this amazing piece of equipment and you're able to get this amazing shot and then it's just gone. Yeah, it was like the <laughs> I just have the worst luck with live streams. So this is this is the telescope here. I don't even know if I really posted um, too much really about it, but it's it's huge. Um, 
it's really, really big. It weighs about 90 pounds. Um, yeah, let me see. I also had, so here you can kind of get a sense of scale. I'm standing next to it. And it's, it's as big as me. The, you know, wow. it's a 10 inch diameter. It's huge. <laughs> so yeah, it was, it was no joke. Um, but it, it, it'll be really fun. I, and I'm definitely going to try it again. Um, for That's super cool, mission. man. Yeah. Yeah. And, and check out my friends, the cosmic perspective. They're actually, um, consider the cosmos. They helped me run it. Um, that's Mary Liz Bender and Ryan Shalinsky. They were out there and they helped me and my camera assistant, Michael. Um, we basically set all this stuff up. It was a, it was a lot of work, like, like we were talking about. Um, here, I guess this is a cool shot. I'll share this with you guys too. Um, it's, yeah, it was fun, but it's a ton of hard work. But this is, um, this is us setting up in front of the, the VAB. This is the press site. And... It was a gorgeous morning. Luckily, the weather was just perfect, except for the stupid clouds. <laughs> the one cloud that just but came by. Was this sort of like a flex cloud. also on, on the other major media out there? Be like, oh, yeah, that's cute, that little uh, camera you got. I got a freaking telescope <laughs> with a joystick. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it was like intended to be a flex in that sense, but for me, I just like to always... Every time I go out to the cave, I'm like, "What else can I do? Yeah. What else can I do?" And it's just a mat. It's just me always trying to like one up myself, really. Jenny and, and always gives me cool a hard time. Jenny always gives me a hard time because every like Tesla event, I'm always like, "Ooh, I need a new camera for this one." And she's like, <laughs> "Stop buying!" Because then what? 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 Without exception, every time I have a new piece of equipment, I bring to it, and I I'm not really comfortable with it yet, and I screw it up. It's just complete fail. You know, and and I just piece yep. together something at the end. Uh, but then so your mentality I'm, is, if I had a different piece of equipment next time, yes, that would be yes. the difference, <laughs> right? Well, see, it's because I didn't get that one. It's you know, right? I went with the, this I, one. I need to, yeah. That's my exact mentality, and that's my exact <laughs> problem too. Like perfectly. Oh crap! But um, <laughs> but yeah, so. We did have, you know, a lot of people, I saw a lot of questions of people saying, that wasn't a legit test because they, the booster blew up after the star, you know, the dragon capsule like pulled away and all, you know, all this stuff. Um, friendly reminder that <laughs> boosters, like, okay, if a booster blows up while a, a rocket's attached to it, spoiler alert, you're not going to outrun the, the, explosion. the explosion. Like the explosion's going to happen, you know, and all you're trying to do is you're trying to get away from it as quickly as possible. Like you're not going to outrun it. You're just trying to get away. And um, don't forget the Dragon capsule is pressurized. So it obviously needs to be able to hold against the pressure of, you know, space and all of that stuff. But it also needs to hold um, and, and handle the thermal re-entry. And re-entering from space is a lot hotter than an explosion. A lot hotter. Mm. What so about the if you can handle though? re-entering, again, that's, you know, it's not as uh, probably not a huge pressure dis differential, and for such a short period of time compared to, um, you know, it's one one bar of pressure difference between sea level and space that it already has to handle. Um, yeah, it it's not that big of a test. Like when you see that one video of little Joe um, carrying the Apollo capsule, and you see little Joe tearing apart and the Apollo capsule pulling from it. It is able to stay in front of the flame front, you know, and in front of the debris field. And that's, ex you can measure that out. Like, that's a measurable thing. I'm like, oh, here's how fast things are going. Here's how fast it pulled away. And and don't forget, you know, during those periods, if the booster blows up, the, the deceleration forces from that, you know, that airstream, because that airstream is that maximum pressure, that's going to be pushing everything back. So if you're still accelerating forward, that's acceler you know, that's going to be basically slamming on the brakes behind you. Mm -hmm. um, all that debris and all that breakup. So um, it is a completely valid test. It's a, that's how you test that thing. And as a matter of fact, you know, SpaceX again is the only one to do that. And Boeing um, opted not to do an in-flight abort test, mostly because their um, whole system is, would be, it'd be more expensive to test on a, you know, any kind of rocket. They'd probably have to sacrifice an Atlas V which is three or four hundred million dollars or whatever. Um, SpaceX sacrificed a booster booster that's already flown. This was the yeah, fourth I was gonna, flight. So I was going to ask you that. I, I saw some title that was something, and you know, 
shame on me for not reading further, but something about the very first uh, Block 5 got retired? Or, like, was the one that just was blown up the very first Block 5 or something? Was there a relationship there? Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. It was the very first Block 5 they ever flew. It first flew on uh, Bonga Bondu, so it started with a bang, because it's it's spelled (laughs) B-A-N-G. Started with a bang and ended with a bang. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> uh, so, so yeah sure 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 yeah yeah <laughs> any questions you guys have about a uh, about well, in-flight abort so um i guess something that I, I think i saw answered on twitter but i'm gonna bring it up anyway is that uh uh okay so the engines on the falcon 9 stopped firing for like a millisecond before the capsule flew away um, mm-hmm. that was not pre-programmed or anything like they, they shut down like the, that was something that the, the crew dragon did on its own. It wasn't like programmed to do it after this happened. It was like they shut down the engines and then it, you know, noticed and said, well, I'm out of here and, and flew away. Right. So that's something I really tried to get clarification on. So we had the pre, the pre-flight press conference and the post-flight press conference, the pre-flight people were kind of asking about that. That only made it more confusing for me. So I asked about it again in the post-flight press conference um, and even stopped and was like, so you're saying, and it still is a little bit unclear to me, but what I believe happened, and what I believe happened is they programmed in an abort time. And the first thing the abort sequence does is actually shut the engines down. So that's the chain of commands is, you know, if there is a problem, the first part of the sequence and basically in parallel is to shut the engines down and fire up the abort system. So I don't think, so I think they were serial, you know, like they were linked. I don't mm. think it was a, if this, then that situation mm. where if, which is, which is programmed, mm. you know, the dragon capsule would uh, sense a loss of thrust and do it. But in this case, it was a simultaneous. Um, it was the literally like the abort button got hit which then would trigger the engines to shut down and the dragon capsule to escape. Mm. Okay. That's so, the best of my knowledge from what I can from what I tried getting out of Elon yeah. and I was like, "So you're saying it wasn't like uh, I'm trying to figure out did something ca- like was it this happened and therefore it caused the abort system to go or like and mm-hmm. from what I could understand Yeah, like they it, triggered basically... the thing that would naturally trigger an abort and they didn't like those two systems didn't know about each other or something, right? You know where but they would try to simulate know. something went wrong and then it automatically did it, right? So for sure though, the computer did not see it coming. Like the computer didn't okay, know right. it was going to receive this abort signal, so they basically treated it as if, um, basically as if it had manually been pulled even. Yeah. Um, so the computer didn't know. Um, so by doing that, they fully validated the entire abort sequence, basically, because, you know, even if they had this way, they could validate that they that the abort sequence does shut down the engines and everything. So I think it was the most robust way to really be able to mm-hmm. um, really figure it out is my understanding. So I know there's not like a big red button on a control panel that somebody pushed to make the rocket explode. But wouldn't that be awesome? Like, what well, if you could win a prize yeah. and like that was that was the that was the prize? It was that like was you get to press that button and watch the thing blow up. Like Te- be... Tesla referral yeah. prize. <laughs> hey, <laughs> I like that. You get to blow that up a Falcon Nine. That's like Seriously. the. Uh, um, well, I was gonna say the we talked about it before was San Diego. We had the big uh, our fireworks show, and one year they all went off yeah. at the same time, yeah. and so to prevent that, they removed the button that does that. <laughs> like <laughs> why that button exists i <laughs> Did some guy just like lean on it like oh crap yeah yeah i got hungry and I, I got hungry and i pushed like, the, the the launch button i wanted some launch right why would they have like wouldn't you want like the opposite like turn off all fireworks button but instead they're like turn on all fireworks like when yeah. would you ever need that right that's i don't funny. know i mean i love that it exists because that's i would want to push that right you know <laughs> Someone's like, I've been doing this for 32 years and I've never hit this button. This is the day. Yeah, <laughs> it is. this That's is it. it. I'm retiring tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, it is an ironic way to like, I imagine they're going off boom, boom, boom. And then it's like, oh, there's something wrong. We got to shut this down. Oh, we're pushing through all the way. 
<laughs> he's like, you, you can't just stop it. We must continue. Or, or, or maybe it was like a stop Jeez. button, but they, they switched the wires um, to where it was, like, you know, <laughs> re- reverse the polarity. So just black and red. Whoop. Yeah. Whoops. Oopsie. Oh, that's funny. Well, either way, it was a very viral video that was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Sh- shook my windows. Yeah. I remember <laughs> I was in the town at the time. <laughs> yeah. Shook the whole building. Yeah. Yeah, so um, so in-flight abort looked to be great. The coolest thing is um, this was the last major milestone for the commercial crew program um, on the SpaceX side of things. So um, they said in the press conference, oh, t- uh, two things. Number one, they actually also did a, a mini press conference afterwards with uh, Bob and Doug, the two, um, Bob Hurley and Doug Benkin. Benkin? Is that their yeah. names? Yeah, B- Benkin. Um, on the, uh, that'll be the first crew to fly on Dragon. And they came in about an hour later and kind of answered a few more questions for 15 minutes. And one of them is like, you know, what is your abort situation like? You know, how can you actually do that um, as astronauts? What are your options? And it is actually, there's a red handle that you turn and pull and that will trigger that abort system immediately Mm. to you. If there's something, you know, say a loss of pressure or something that they could sense internally or something going wrong, you know, you get the P or something, you know, just pull that handle. It's like a mechanical yeah. switch, though. Not well. I'm sure there's still computers involved, but it's not like, oh, hey, the screen froze, and I need to abort now. Uh, right. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's it's what happened. Probably directly. I don't know if you guys saw this. This is the most bizarre Tesla bug. But in a model, my Model X MCU one, if you search for "This Is America," which is a song by Childish Gambino, it crashes mm. the computer. <laughs> I posted the video on Twitter. I was like, what? This is the most bizarre, what? You know? What? Yeah. Uh, is that and, a statement and, uh, of some kind? I, well, that's what I was wondering. I'm like, hmm. Uh, but yeah, you know, that that whole thing, like, that was something, Tim, I'm curious your thoughts on. I mean, so the Dragon capsule, the astronauts are there. It's basically just some giant screens that they have, right? Mm-hmm. I'm sure there's a lot more going on, but... Are we worried at all just about the reliability of software and screens in a general sense? I'm sure that they're doing everything possible to make sure none, no issues there, but it's software. Software is made by humans. We are fallible. Like, like there's always going to be, there's never going to be something th- that exists such as software without bugs. Like every piece of software right. ever will always have bugs. So like right. it, w- what's the thought process going there instead of having a million physical buttons like you know, a soy user or something like that. Yeah, that's a, a great question. And that was another thing that we were kind of asking the astronauts about is like, what can you actually do? If there's any kind of yeah. problem, what do you, what can you do? And their answer was really interesting. Basically, they're saying um, on, so because the Dragon capsule's really only having one job, it's going to the International Space Station. It's not some crazy complicated mission with all these like, you know, we're going to go here, we're going to rendezvous with this, then we're going to refuel, then we're going to do this, we're going to hit the, you know, try to get to the asteroid, do these things, land, you know, like the Apollo missions had like, you know, hundreds of sequences of events, right? Where the astronauts actually had a lot more interface where it's like, you know, is it life critical or mission critical, basically? And can we outweigh and, you know, maybe rearrange some things to make sure that, you know, it's life critical? Um and these missions to the International Space Station, because it's just doing one thing, really, and you're right there in low Earth orbit, <clears throat> your only real option is if it's not going right, you abort, you know. Mm-hmm. And from that point on, the only thing that it needs to do is is abort. It, it needs to reenter. And um, so once they're in, so basically, if, if the vehicle messes up on orbit, like getting it to orbit, if the rocket fails... Um, their abort thing basically just gets them on the ground. So that's the only interface they have. Once they're in orbit, they can manually fly it using the touch screens. But at that point, you're pretty much, um, you know, there's nothing crazy that's going to happen. You know what I mean? Like you're just going to the International Space Station. You're doing some orbit raises and a few maneuvers. And that's it. You know? And it so, seems like that could be pre-programmed or controlled from the ground even. It's 100% pre-programmed. In yeah. the ideal situation, the astronauts won't have to do anything. Mm. You know, just like the Dragon capsule now, which goes to the International Space Station, uh, it's coming up on its 20th mission. 
has never once had human interference yeah. other than or you know other than like resetting the computers once and and on the like the very first mission mm. but uh, there's no like manual flying for that at all so you're saying you train super hard to become an astronaut to do nothing <laughs> that's well this is <laughs> and that's Just in case. and that's kind of a little bit of the touchy subject <laughs> is that you know we're we're employing some of the best test pilots and and pilots in the world to be passengers right, right. but really the the era of the of these modern day astronauts they're very much less often pilots and they're much more often scientists and right. researchers you know they're going up for long duration stays on the international space station doing science and that type of exploration and they aren't necessarily um, hard core pilots they don't need to be right um, versus like the days of Neil Armstrong and John Glenn and those guys you were like a fighter pilot first right Right, and then yep. you know, because that was the the mindset, yeah. Yep. The space force, and it was experimental, the steely eyed missile craft. Man. So, there it is, exactly. So, so this is the the last step to actually. What is it? Demo two, where the where Bob and Doug are. I I call them by their first name, like we're buds or something. But uh, <laughs> so, I've heard rumors on timelines for that. Do do you know like when that's going to be? So basically, since these are the this was the final big milestone, we're hopefully you know they're shipping the the Dragon capsule to the Cape as we uh, in February ish, not as we speak, but mm -hmm. around February it should arrive. Um, if everything gets certified and checks out okay, they'll likely I think they still have a few more parachute tests to do. Believe it or not, mm -hmm. the parachutes um, are going well. Uh, NASA seem to be very pleased, but they just have to finish that certification and then hopefully. Q2 ish, like you know, Q2 would be the earliest that we'd see um, DM2. So mm -hmm. I'm guessing and that the Tim Dodd Gasometer is um, the Tim Dodd Gasometer is. Uh, I'm saying May for actual astronauts taking off. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Huh. And it's cool, but it's also a lot longer than I would have liked, if I'm being honest. You know. You mean in the grand scheme of Obviously. things or since since right now? Everything. Well, <laughs> like, I thought it'd be May last year, you know? Yeah, yeah. But here we are. So, But that's oh why well. it's that much better that it's finally going to happen. That's true. That's true. That's me being that's true. Good to, things to are positive. worth waiting for. So so that one is not going to go to the ISS. It's just, it's just going to orbit a few times, right? No, it will go to the ISS. Oh, okay. And the current... The current question is whether or not it's for only two weeks and and Doug and Bob just kind of hang out and like try to stay out of the way of the other crew <laughs> on board or if they make it into a full like extended three-month mission basically wow okay so yeah so they go it's, up there uh, and they're like you gotta definitely... place me to sleep man you, you got a futon I can crash on or something <laughs> seriously there is kind of some of that that's it's nuts it's, it's gonna be a crazy time to schedule right now for the ISS hmm. because so hard to predict when all this stuff is going to be ready and as soon as it is they got to make some plans and who logistics nightmare seriously mm. um speaking of nightmares ouch huh <laughs> boeing starliner uh did have a few more problems coming up now this is a little bit of this i don't know what the good sources on this are but i do trust eric berger from ars technica and some of this stuff makes sense. So um, it sounds like NASA wasn't quite pleased uh, with the Starliner's performance for that CF for the um, for the OFT mission that was in December. Remember, we already know about the clock anomaly mm -hmm. that made it um, not able to get into orbit. But apparently, because of that, it stressed its thrusters so much that NASA is really not might not be pleased. I'm going to say might and maybe because. Um, we'll probably likely see all of this in the report because NASA is filing, you know, a multi-month uh, investigation of the issue and they will be filing a report on it. So I, I'll wait to kind of see all that, but it would make sense. The thrusters were firing for quite a while. They got quite saturated. They got quite hot. Um, apparently one of the thrusters didn't even fire and eight of them were underperforming. Awesome. So what, what Boeing ended up doing is... Um, I think we're just going to have to call it on these shoot um there you are hey 
Okay, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna stop my video. Is that okay? <coughs> yeah, that should help oh, things quite we're a bit. looking at the screen right now. Should take so. less bandwidth. Yeah, and you guys are running the screen locally, so hopefully that's a little easier on my crappy internet. Okay, uh, I'll just keep going here. So, you ready? Mm -hmm. Go. Okay. Um, so one of the things that Boeing did because they were in orbit, they practiced kind of like if they were going to be going towards the International Space Station preparing to dock. And if they had to abort from that, they fire up some thrusters and, and pull away. They performed that maneuver and uh, apparently that underperformed and mm -hmm. may not be within like certifi certificationable <laughs> range, uh, which is which would really be a shame. So. Uh, yeah, so we'll have to wait to hear more about this, but I just thought, you know, Eric Berger, again, I, I do trust him as a source from Ars Technica. And if, if there's really problems, kind of basic problems with the, with the thrusters and the, the manifold that feeds all of the different thrusters and all that stuff, this could really be a pretty substantial delay and another just absolute, like, you know, nail in the coffin for Boeing of like, guys, really, this, this had to happen now. <laughs> amidst all of the things that, that Boeing's already going through. Yeah, it's, they're having a no good, very really, bad year. Really be, yes, yes. So I really hope that this gets resolved and, and figured out pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, that's... Yeah, uh, it's, yeah, could be a major bummer. But I want to talk about one more thing that just cropped up recently. This was um, a, apparently some reports were that fi the Firefly in, in Texas uh, basically like blew up. And uh, what it really was, when you start reading about it, it was just a pretty normal s test. And the local residents were not ready for, <laughs> for a test of this magnitude. So um, Firefly Aerospace is kind of, they're sort of similar to Rocket Lab. Um, as far as scale, they're, they're a pretty sm uh, small sat launcher. Um, go ahead and pull up the, the Firefly Alpha there, Ben. And um, so it, it's a it's bigger than it's kind of like in between it's it's almost like a Falcon One sized vehicle, but with a thousand kilograms payload to Leo, so um, quite a, about four times more than what um, you know than what Rocket Lab's Electron is capable of. But they were one of the, my favorite things is they were going to utilize the, an aerospike, and then all of a sudden they decided nah, aerospikes are too hard, and they went with these other engines now, um, known as the the Reaver engine. So they too have backed out of their aerospike dreams, but they basically were doing a test the other night and uh, I guess it went fine, but everyone reported an explosion because that's basically what a rocket engine is. But they may have had some kind of small fire on the pad that, that got extinguished um, locally, but all the, regardless, so many people in the local community called the fire department reporting an explosion that the fire department went down anyway and kind of, it was this whole thing, but apparently everything's fine. And that was just kind of them mm -hmm. testing f scale at scale like that for the first time. And it spooked out all the locals. At least that's my understanding. Um, I didn't really have a lot of time to, to find out what exactly went on in this one, but kind of cool that if, if as long as everything did go fine, that's a good sign for Firefly because I'm, I'm ready to see those guys uh, put something into orbit. That'd be awesome. I like how there's a user guide on their website. Like, okay, guys, here's where you put the payload in. Okay, and if you need to take the <laughs> payload out, like you just got to push this button. <laughs> this is kind of funny. First, try turning it That's off and what... turning it back on. <laughs> yeah, step one. <laughs> if your thing's not in space and it's supposed to be, <laughs> yeah, try this. <laughs> step one: Are you in space? Step, <laughs> step two: Do not open the door. <laughs> But this is that's normal actually for all rocket companies to develop a payload user's guide so that people know their dimensions, mm -hmm. how many G's the, their their payload's going to experience, and at what point, you know, the axes of forces, the the resonance, the actual vibrations, all of these things actually have to be taken into into account, and it's just kind of it, it is pretty cool actually. It's kind of like a so. developer's kit. SDK. Yeah. It's funny. It kind of just reminds me of like, hey, check out my new online course. Download the free PDF right here. <laughs> 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 the website's like like trying to advertise you something you know seriously seriously texas uh, represent yeah that's, that's pretty all much i gotta say <laughs> that's pretty much it for me for for space news um and for those of you watching sorry that you're just seeing half maybe some or all of my words that say everyday astronaut but uh the bandwidth here is so bad 
on all the different devices we've tried that I'm just going to be uh, some words. But yeah. audio is still here. Yay. Yay. And if you didn't know, yeah. we do post this on YouTube. And you can watch along and see all the things we're talking about. I saw some comments recently that were like, wait a minute, I didn't know you posted this on YouTube. So I thought that was worth mentioning. <laughs> and vice versa. If you're, if you're on YouTube and you're the type of person that likes to listen to podcasts while you drive and stuff like that, we also cater to you. Yeah. And you know what's funny is like, I, I don't know how people find it on, on the podcast. I mean, I'm glad they do. And we've had some, some lovely reviews on there and I appreciate that. But I'm always kind of like... How, how do people even know we're there? <laughs> like to me, I'm, maybe I'm just in YouTube world all the time. So I just assume that that's where everybody finds us. Yeah. And we also have a, you know, on, on the website now, every time we post a new episode, it creates a new web page. So if you were to search for it in Google, it may, you know, show mm. up with all the notes and, and everything. Um, as well as we have our email list there. So that's actually going kind of well where if you, because, you know, with YouTube, the deal is you have the algorithm and whether or not it chooses to share your video with someone regardless of whatever they choose to do is up in the air. Um, so the, you know, the surefire way is either uh, on on your podcast player or on the email list because we'll just send you an email with every episode that comes out. So if you guys are wondering how to stay connected, um, we got we got you covered. We got options. Mm -hmm. We got options. So, th so those who are driving right now, hello and keep your eyes on the road. Yes. yes. And we are, we are not inside of your car. We are playing... <laughs> <laughs> that was a Ron Swanson, <laughs> Ron Swanson uh, <laughs> bedtime stories. <laughs> oh. Shout out to them for that. He's like, "Do not be alarmed. I am not in your car right now." In that Nick <laughs> Offerman voice. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, uh, speaking oh, of awesome. going to space, uh, the Tesla stock is uh, is about to reach. Is about to reach there. In fact. <sighs> I don't know what the the exact stock price oh, on a uh, hundred oh kilometers or whatever is, but currently, as uh, we watch it live here, we can just can we just sit and watch this for like thirty minutes? <laughs> <and> call it. <laughs> um, this uh, the stock currently for Tesla is uh, five hundred seventy one dollars twenty four cents. Anyone remember what uh, it IPO'd at in twenty ten? I don't. Oh, no seventeen dollars. <laughs> Wow. So you are up uh, thirty three point five times of whatever your investment was then wow. is, is what you have now. So uh, I'm glad everyone took my advice to not buy it a few uh, months ago when I posted that video. So you know you're welcome for that. Uh, <laughs> the question is what's going on and and why is it uh, why yeah. is it hitting this? Why now? Um, yeah. Well, and if you go back, so uh, I'll describe what we're, what are shown on the screen here, but. Um, I, I like this market watch website it has a really good kind of layout and you kind of um, kind of this advanced charting mode you can see the history of things and kind of play with the the data a little bit so if you go back a year you can see you know it it uh, in January 24th 2019 um, it was right around 291 dollars a share uh, which actually wasn't bad if you remember there was uh, in 2019 or I'm trying 2018 it was a lot of ups and downs 2019 as well. But it has just been on an absolute tear since about October, late October, which is when we got uh, delivery numbers for Q3. And uh, I think uh -huh. they, they had that surprise profit uh, in uh -huh. Q3. You saw a jump, uh, you know, in two days by 100 points or so. And it's, you know, I mean, it's it's like doubled since then. Um, so... Or more than doubled, uh, technically. So pretty cool, pretty good stuff. I think... What the general consensus seems to be of all the stuff I've read about uh, and tried to follow along here is that Tesla's finally done it. Um, they've actually kind of broken through the FUD and the nonsense and and all that. In fact, there's uh, uh, a recent some recent um, news that came out about sudden ac unintended acceleration where the car would just. If you guys remember the Toyota Prius fiasco way back in the day mm -hmm. uh which if you're looking mm -hmm. for the answer it's cosmic rays uh, and i'm fascinated with this but uh th there was a lawsuit um or the nhtsa or nitsa which is the most horrible way of saying that <laughs> uh are, are going to investigate tesla for this uh and unlike automakers back in the 90s when it was happening to priuses tesla actually has very detailed data about every single car ever so chances are it'll be dismissed and 
Tesla put out a statement saying, guess what? That lawsuit was brought on by a short seller. So no. there's no evidence of this according to them, yada, yada. But point being, like, the people that were spreading misinformation and trying to cast doubt and all that, um, n- not the reasonable people that were like, you know, back when Model 3 was just barely getting rolling going, mm, I don't know, you know. <laughs> they're, they're not like an automaker with 100 years of history behind them. So we'll see. Like, you know, I think there was a lot of legitimate mm. kind of uncertainty. Uh, but it seems that they've passed that. The Model 3 is just crushing, uh, you know, in terms of deliveries. They are continuing to crush. As well as now, the China factory is up and running. Um, there's even been people trying to cast doubt on that. And so someone posted a video showing the stamping machine creating thousands of cars at the China factory already. <laughs> so so I, I, I mean, my guess is that in, in basically what drives the stock price is a lot of speculation by big time investors. So here's the deal, right? If somebody that has, I don't know, a billion dollars to, to play within the market and they're saying, we think Tesla's going to go to a thousand bucks in terms of the, the, the share price. Well, guess what? All the other people that don't have a billion dollars are like, oh, man. I better buy some stock now. And so it creates mm. this swell. Um, and so this is why, again, I the whole thing to me is kind of a rigged speculative system. It's not really based on reality or fact. But that's basically seeming what's going on is everyone seems to be positive on it, really driving this up. And it's backed by the deliveries. And we're going to have an earnings call here next week. Uh, a lot of people are expecting another profit. If so, I think that would make the fifth uh, quarter, the fifth time they've shown profit profitability in the past like eight quarters or something like that so doing extremely well uh but yeah i mean just basically all the stuff is happening and it's all going the right direction currently um and and so yeah i think that's what's really driving this up here and it's reaching just record record levels here Hmm. you know i didn't when, when you said the china factory that for some reason flipped a switch in my head it's like oh maybe Maybe to the investor types, it's not real unless you've got a factory in China. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The The other thing for me is, uh, you know, we're just seeing like record after record of deliveries and, and the demand is still very consistent. And I think people just didn't realize the, the effect that Elon talks about all the time, which is... These will sell great once they're in customers' hands and more people get to mm-hmm. experience the Tesla. Because then it'll make people, it, th- that's something that's not very tangible. But all of us as Tesla owners have experienced that where you get someone in the car and they're like, no way. Mm-hmm. You know, and they're, I can't believe it does that. You know, there's so many things and it's, it, so many of those things are untangible. And it's not until it starts taking effect and the more that are on the road, the more people experience them. And the more the demand goes up, just kind of naturally, yeah. you know, and it's amazing. You know what I've been thinking? I would, I, I would love it. I mean, it doesn't affect me because I've already got one. But if, if they had some kind of program where people could drive one for about a month, because because getting behind the wheel once and doing a test drive, maybe even having it for a day, that's nice. It gives you a taste, and you're like, okay. That's that's cool. Ooh, it does have this acceleration. It's got all the whiz bang features. Blah blah blah. Sure, but but once you really get used to driving it, and then you go back to a gas car, it's just like, oh my god, this is a piece of crap. <laughs> this is so bad. Like you don't you don't you don't realize it until you've gotten away from it for a little while, and then you get back in, and it's just like, oh, like every time I so, drive a gas car now, that's exactly how I feel. I'm like, Ugh, I never want to drive one of these again. It's. You're right, because I think people have all these misconceptions about how inconvenient it is still. And that I too, had this yeah. Twitter, a, a Twitter uh, conversation with someone. And, it, it, you know, it was, super, it was actually really friendly there, for, uh, a fan of mine. But conversation, I me, in quotes. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I had a, uh, that video of me charging up at the V3 in Nashville. And I was getting like 900 miles of range per hour. Yeah. Just cooking on V3. And it was amazing. And I was super stoked. But unfortunately, because I didn't have a destination... In it's still in the top left part of my screen said 55 minutes till full oh. mm. because you know it's gonna sit there and trickle forever for the la- like you know the last right. the last five percent of charge would take a half hour or whatever almost you know yeah so someone goes I'm supposed to be impressed that it's gonna take 55 minutes to fill up your car and I'm like well I mean realistically it'll do you know 100 100 miles in about five minutes he goes so it's still three times slower than my car <laughs> well, yeah. he goes how how is that any more convenient I go. Well, I mean, honestly, 
how often are you driving more than 300 miles a day? And he kept skirting the question over right. and over. We were talking. I go, no, tell me, more than 50% of your time driving, are you driving more than 300 miles in a day? And he's like, you know, eventually got around and he goes, well, I mean, honestly, this is like literally after 10 things. He goes, honestly, I live in New Zealand. And if I drive 300 miles in any direction, I'm in the ocean. <laughs> I'm like, dude, like, Get bent. You're, that's exactly Bud. what I'm talking Bud. about is that Bud. you would literally be like <laughs> better off and it'd be more convenient yeah. for you in your daily usage than any other vehicle, period. Yeah, there's there's a there's a lot to be said about that. In fact, uh, I don't know if I've told the story on here before, but I met a guy at a Charger once, not a Tesla Charger, um, and he was in a Chevy Spark, and he said, you know, you convinced me to buy this car. And I kind of chuckled, like, how? I, I, <laughs> if I've said anything about the Chevy Spark, it probably wasn't positive. Um, <laughs> but the deal was is that when you looked at the numbers behind it, which I guess this, you know, made me feel good that he actually did the math on it. He freed the deal. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, his, <laughs> it, I think it was his daughter uh, is going to college, and it's like forty miles away. He's retired, um, or works from home, or something where he doesn't really need to drive anyways. And so he got the Chevy Spark, which you guys don't know is kind of like I guess you could say the predecessor to the Bolt. It's a smaller, like smart car size vehicle, mm -hmm. and I think mm -hmm. the range is eighty or ninety miles on it, which is pretty impressive actually for for that small of a vehicle. Um, but it was it was just enough for him to get there and back and to do his little stuff around town. And he doesn't go on road trips or travel that much or anything. And it was nine thousand dollars used with like ten thousand miles on it. Wow. Yeah. I, and I'm like, hallelujah. You mm -hmm. know, right. I, I think that if more people were smarter about that, like I, like fr freakazoids like me that want a five hundred mile range EV are just stupid. Okay, people <laughs> don't need that. Um, I, I do argue that fa super fast charging people need everywhere, but you really don't need a 500 mile tank of, of, uh, of electrons. You know, you don't, uh, but people seem to think they do. I think that reasonably, if you're coming out with a new EV, you should be looking at 300 miles or greater, um, or mm -hmm. you're going super, super cheap. So if you say 150 miles, I want that thing about 10 grand brand new. Maybe maybe twelve or thirteen with some options, you know. I think those are those right. are your price points. It's a city car, cool. It's super cheap and economical. That's why I get it. Mm -hmm. I'm not getting it to go zero to sixty in three seconds. I'm not getting it to go long distance travel. I'm getting it to be super functional, save me money, save the planet, all those things. Super in favor of that. Most automakers are doing neither of those things. They're they're right. creating really low range, really expensive cars that are just stupid. Or they're, you know, trying to create these long range ones and, and it's just then they're failing at it basically. But yeah. yeah, I mean it's a good point, you know. So um mm -hmm. Jason over at uh Engineering Explained had a video this morning I was watching uh when I got up and he did something that I thought was pretty interesting. I'd never seen anybody really cover it like this before, you know, kind of put this thought experiment out there, but it was basically like imagine if way back in the day electric cars had won out over combustion engines. And just today or just, you know, in this year or whatever, combustion engines finally hit the market. And it was like, everybody was going, oh, there's this great new, you know, combustion engine car. Let's go check this out. And then you go get behind the wheel and there's no torque. And, yeah. it, you know, you press the accelerator and it takes a second. It's like, what's this about? And it was basically talking about like, if you were used to driving an electric car and then you had, you know, to use a gas car, would it be a step up or would it be a step down? Most of us would most of us, I think, would think it was a step down. And uh, mm -hmm. I thought that was an interesting 100%. way of, you know, kind of framing the whole thing. Um, but, yeah, the whole, like, you know, uh, Tim, what you were just talking about, the guy talking about, oh, the I'd have to stop and charge for 30 minutes or whatever. It is a very small segment of the population that are driving more than 300 miles a day on, on yeah. a regular basis, you know? Yeah. And, and really, the biggest thing for me since I got this car is, wow, I don't have to, like, if I'm on my way to a, a, a job or a work or going to see a friend or whatever, and it's like, oh, I have to stop and pump gas. I don't have to do that, mm. ever, ever, <laughs> you know? Like, it's it's so much more convenient, and it's it's just the complete opposite on a daily basis of what people seem to think or what the FUD is out there around it. Yeah, 90% of the time you're not charging at a supercharger or yeah. anything like that. You're charging at home. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, unless you live in an apartment or something and you don't have access to charging at your apartment, then that is then true. That. And and in fact, this is where. So I I'll I just want to go out and say that I was wrong about this before, where I was saying, why do we need ChargePoint? Or someone had a thing that they're saying we're gonna we're gonna install 2.5 million level two chargers. And my whole thing was like, why the hell do we need that? We need long distance chargers, super fast ones. We don't need just mm. like run of the mill ones because you're going to be more expensive than my own mm. house. Why would I ever use that? Um, it doesn't make any sense. I was wrong, and here's why: is because cities now, in fact, San Diego is one of them, where we're actually subsidizing uh, or giving like tax breaks to new apartment buildings and new apartment complexes and things to install these chargers. Mm. And so, in fact, where I park my car, there are six charge point chargers. But if you go on the map and look at ChargePoint, they don't show up. And the reason is, is because to, to use them, you have to be a resident. You have to have a key fob, et cetera, et cetera. And they're free. Mm. So cool. it's free EV charging from now. ChargePoint just happens to be the, you know, the, the basically the, the vendor of the thing. The building owners are paying for it and they're getting tax breaks from the city, which is saying, hey, you have to do it. So I think that that's going to change um, to where even people in like this is a newer building. And I think in like the two levels of parking garage that I've been on, you know, I don't like go wandering the whole parking garage. Uh, there are six total chargers that are all totally free level two. Two of them are actual wow. Tesla destination chargers, which again, don't show up on the Tesla destination charger map because they're only for residents. So, so I cool. think like, I think it's going to become, I mean, those things change slowly over time, but when you know cities and counties and states or whatever put money forth to do that you know surprise surprise behavior changes so i think we're going to see that even for apartment dwellers the percentage of time you need uh, an external charger away from you is going to start to drop as well mm -hmm. and i think that you know there's there's always the the concern about chicken and egg syndrome with ev adoption you know there is who who's going to buy an electric car when there's no inf infrastructure and who's going to build the infrastructure when there's no cars there's finally like a huge amount of electric cars on the road you know i mean we're not getting to the point where it's you know 50 percent of the cars on the road but but we're finally seeing where there's actually demand where people are walking into hotels going hey why don't you guys have a charging station mm -hmm. for me why yeah. you know starting to actually go to their town halls and be like hey you know i drive an electric car now and it'd be really convenient you know, there's a lot of people. And so now it'll, I think it'll just keep going and going and going to the point where we're going to laugh at this era of like, do you remember back in the day you couldn't, you had to kind of plan yeah. and you had to think about charging mm -hmm. and it was a thing and like people were all worried about it. And, and it's just like, that's not going to, I think it'll only take like three or four years before it catches up because the adoption rate's so high. Well, to that point as well, in in that time span, I'm I'm pretty sure we're gonna see some battery breakthroughs, um, in this space that are gonna make it like you, you. There may be a day when range anxiety is something you associate with gas cars. Mm -hmm. um, mm. The the only exception is yeah, you can refill in five minutes or whatever, right? But I could see if the battery technology continues to to grow and, 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 you know, innovate at that pace where we could easily have a thousand mile range EV in, in 10 years from now or something like that, where no gas car even, I mean, you know, let's say like a 50 gallon tank or something doesn't have a shot at that. Right. Yeah. So I think, right. um, you know, I think it's an interesting time in, in batteries. I was thinking about this the other day. I think Joe, one of your videos talked about it. Like, uh, you know, <laughs> you probably have a video on this show. It's like the major inventions that have influenced, uh, you know, mankind, well, you have like fire, right? I guess it's not an invention, but like you know, mm. how how to harness it. They have like the wheel, right? That's probably a, probably a big one. Uh, maybe the printing press down the road. Maybe the steam engine. So, you know, there's a few things that that have happened here. Um, the lithium ion battery is definitely one of these things uh, that literally powers. Like if you just look around everywhere you go, so mm. much of what our world is today is based on that one technology. Um, and, mm -hmm. and imagine, you know, as that evolves, like the, we're going to hit that again, batteries are going to be, are already are, but are, are like going to be just some of the most useful things we've ever created as humans. I think mm -hmm. you've seen the graduate, the movie, the graduate Dustin Hoffman, Dustin mm -hmm. Hoffman. Yeah. Back in the day, he, like in the late sleeping 60s with the mom. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, there's a, there's a, he, he, gra- well, he graduates. That's why it's called the graduate, but he graduates college and he's, he's having some party to celebrate. And, and this older guy keeps coming up and he's like, one word, plastics. Oh, right. Plastics. Yeah. Today it would be batteries, I think, or right. energy storage, I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Plastics are another one too that probably falls in that category. Now it's a huge problem, but at <laughs> yeah. the time that reduced waste, right? Mm-hmm. Because it was a byproduct of refining crude oil, if I remember correctly. It yeah. was like part of the things. And who was it, Rockefeller or somebody? Somebody that was like the big oil guy at the time was like, well, why can't we figure out something to do with that stuff? And it was all the waste from the stuff that they had used from the crude oil to process to gasoline yeah. or whatever. And it turned out to be, well, let's make this thing out of it. And it turned into, you know, it's obviously a negative Everything. now, but at the time, at the <laughs> time, things got cheap. I mean, you know, everything has like a positive and negative, I think. So, yeah. especially batteries. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I, I just <laughs> <So>. got it. <laughs> Anodes and cathodes. Yeah. So sorry. I want to I want to kind of wrap this up and, and move it into the because we were talking about the stock and the speculation of, of mm. it being, you know, just skyrocketing. Do you think right now the stock is inflated because there's rumors about Model Y? Is that because I've been hearing a lot about that? Is there is that what are your thoughts on that? Because. That sounds pretty exciting, and I can see why that would bump the stock price. Yeah, so there have been some rumors of the Model Y being delivered next month. Um, apparently, one person that posted on Reddit got a phone call and uh, said the performance model will be available next month for delivery, and then I'll wheel drive after that. Uh, I, I, yeah, that probably affected the stock price, and I think it's completely complete fake news <laughs> i think the chance of model y actually getting delivered before i think may is a good target for seeing actual deliveries besides like 10 that were handmade to employees uh which it, all the ones you see now are all handmade they're not coming off of a line mm-hmm. um but i think that the model y is going to surprise in a lot of ways with other technology that's different than model 3 I know in the exterior and the interior, like it looks the same, but I think the Model Y is going to be a dramatically improved uh, tech that actually powers it. So we'll see what happens there. But what? wait, like, do you have any spec? It sounds like you're you're knowing something. You're holding off. Do you have any speculation <laughs> on that? I know there's no. a wire situation. The the I don't right. know what you call it, but they're cutting down on the, the amount wiring of wiring. Flex, yeah. The flex circuit should cut down on the wiring. Makes it makes it easier to produce, and it and it's like a an order of magnitude. It's like a hundred meters versus a kilometer difference. Um, right. And then, uh, you know, Elon on the third row podcast, I think it's called, uh, mm-hmm. talked about Maxwell batteries be having a big impact. And that's good news. I think we've all speculated about that, but it seems like Model Y would be the right, you know, time if they could get that going. Um, I just think that we're going to see a lot, a lot of stuff here that the Model Y is going to be sort of a sleeper. I think, uh, and probably blow, you know, the doors off of a lot of other thing, you know, like it's going to, it's going to be, if, 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 if my, you know, r- the rumor mill here and, and in my prediction, it's going to be a thing where you're like, oh, it just was a boring unveiling. It basically <laughs> is a copy of the model three with a couple, you know, different functional tweaks, B- I, but you're, you're going to look at the specs and go, oh my God, what is this? It's like something we've never seen. So you think so? I think it could be. I think it's a sleeper. I think people are but, like. But which specs? I think it's. I think you're going to see. Well, if the Maxwell stuff that Elon teased about on that thing come true, you could see a, a lot more range than currently mm-hmm. out there, or cheaper or lighter. You know, there's so many things that could mm-hmm. that could happen. So, so, um, so the rumors are coming three, out there. That'd be but, amazing. What's that? Or all three, and that would be amazing. Yeah. So there's rumors about deliveries. I think that's fake news. Um, I just don't think it's going to happen. Uh, this was something that did come out. I don't know if you guys saw the pictures of the third row in the Model Y. Mm-mm. I did see this. <laughs> yeah, and you can tell from his tone of voice. Uh, did you order the third row, the seven-seater, Tim? I did, but I changed it because Good. I don't know why I did that in the first place. But <laughs> Okay, so according to Tesla, the... Uh, uh, the the from Tesla it's saying room for up to seven adults with optional third row. <coughs> Model Y provides maximum versatility, able able to carry seven passengers and their cargo. 
Uh, each second row seat folds flat and independently, creating a flexible storage for skis, yada, 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 yada. Here's a photo for you to digest and see what the third <laughs> row of the seat of the Model <laughs> Y looks like. For those of you just listening, if... You, so I have a good friend that is a, a quad amputee. He would fit great back here. <laughs> right. There you go. I was thinking if, that, if you slim down your calves a bit, maybe. <laughs> and then have s- no f- feet or anything. Because yeah. it just is straight. Like it's totally flat. Like it looks like it goes like three inches forward and three inches down from the end of the seat to the floor and the seat in front uh-huh. of it. You could maybe put a broom handle in there, basically. Now, so are those on rails though? Like, do, could the middle seats scoot up some? Give I'm a sure. Little extra room. I'm sure. Yeah, it must be. Now, if you're in Kentucky yes. and uh, you're working, and there's a jockey convention, this would be an excellent <laughs> mode of transportation, <laughs> I think. But that's about the size of the person that's going to fit back here. I mean, I I wouldn't even. I don't know. <laughs> it's just such a it's a joke basically like this to me is stupid this is a bad design well what about what about two car seats no you're a dad. absolutely not you, i mean maybe a maybe a seat? booster seat yeah when your kid's older the little bumpy things yeah so the booster seat just basically elevates them so the the uh the shoulder strap on the seat belt comes across to their chest mm. um you know other than yeah but like an actual car seat no, <laughs> I don't even think I have a buddy that has um, that puts him in the back, the third row of the Model X. And uh, even that, I, I mean, because we thought, oh, that'd be kind of cool. And I look back there. I'm like, no way, man. Absolutely not. So, I mean, I'm sure it would fit. But holy cow, that'd be like, you know, you, punishment. Like, hey, you were bad. I'm going to put you in the third row. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not the third row. Dad. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And we are going <laughs> on a road trip, you know. <laughs> so yeah we'll see tell that well, to your therapist someday <laughs> i will have to say so remember i do actually have a reservation for why and a trip like this uh makes me really wish that if the why could keep up with the range and you know if it had a little bit faster range a little bit faster charge rate or something you know uh, than the three to, to count to kind of counter its inefficiency because it is less efficient than a three since it's bigger surface area, a little heavier. Um, I would love to have a Y as far as the storage yeah. and, and more space for what I do, especially my car is packed to the brim. But I just, for this road trip, you know, if I had to add an extra, you know, 30 minutes because of increased charge times and all that stuff and inefficiencies and everything, I don't know if it'd be, it wouldn't be ideal. But if, if they make up for it with a new battery technology or some kind of extra tweaks or something, then that does excite me and that probably would have me replacing my car with a with a Y. Yeah, I was going to say I mean it might actually be lighter than your 3 if you think cool. about it. If they're able to pull off that dry electro thing that you know all the rumors and stuff out there have talked about, it, it would essentially like give you the same energy density but for I forget what it is like 40 or 50% less mm-hmm. weight. So uh wow. Yeah, I mean, but I don't know if that matters cuz the range is would still be the range, right? It it that would Similar, be yeah. That would be the the huge win is, is if they're able to say, hey, I know we said top range 300. It's actually 400. That would be like, yeah. woo. You know, that would oh. blow the doors off of things. So I don't know. I think we'll see. But but really, it goes back to that whole conversation earlier really about how much range do you need? Because really, if they're able to do that, if the Maxwell Tech, they're able to integrate it. And it, the, the goal, I would have to imagine, isn't necessarily longer range it would be cheaper would be the goal because imagine if you could make the model 3 25 grand yeah. brand new that would be i mean god that would just crush the industry mm-hmm. right that would be mm-hmm. a massive it, they, they could no make them, to buy one of those it, it already is but that would be uh yeah so i think i don't know like i, I guess that would be a really interesting question you know if, if we ever got to, to ask elon stuff uh, about <laughs> um hey uh, you know, what would what is the strategy with this? It's probably all of the above, right? You probably will have a longer range one, but is the bigger goal to make it cheaper or is the bigger goal to make it, you know, better, faster charging? Or like, what is the main reason to, you know, advance this other than the sake of just like constantly innovating? I mean, you guys talked about last week, the, the idea of the Chinese model, you know, 
um, and stuff like that. But I think, I think that, you know, in order to not, you know, muddy up your luxury brand too much, like I know that Hyundai kind of had a, an identity crisis when they were selling a, you know, a $13,000 accent and trying to sell what the time was the, the Hyundai Genesis, mm-hmm. yep. you know, which was like a 70,000 or maybe I think they even had one above it. Um, something yeah. even more expensive that was, you know, a, a luxury, you know, it was competing with the, the Lexus, like L, uh, like the 400 series, yeah. like the L series Lexus, you know, and that's a, it can be a hundred thousand dollar car and it had Hyundai on it yeah. and it just doesn't really, it's I, not a, it's not a great idea and for, uh, by most, I guess, logic. Um, but so they ended up making a Genesis brand. Yep. Just like in, we've seen this every with every at least in the U.S. because I guess U.S. consumers do care about that brand name so much. But Hun, you know, Honda and Acura, you know, mm-hmm. and you have Toyota and Lexus. You have Volkswagen and Audi. You have all you know. All of these companies have had to make a a sister company that is basically you know it's the same cars but rebranded. And I, I, I just for that same exact reason, I can't imagine Tesla wanting to sell a car that's under thirty five thousand dollars because. If it does, it kind of sullies the image of the $140,000 Model S and Model X, you know, one, one decked out. It just is, takes yeah. that flagship thing down a, a little bit. So from a branding perspective, I totally get where you're coming from and I agree with you, but I would just, playing devil's advocate, Tesla to the Tesla already is in multiple pies, you know, with the solar and, and that kind of thing. Um, so, I mean, I guess, I guess they could kind of reframe their brand as being not luxury, but just electric, you know, and the future and high tech and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I see where you're coming from though. Yeah. I think it's an interesting, um, I, I, I totally agree. Basically, I, I think a lot of people felt that way with the model three, um, where if you were an S and X, uh, buyer, you know, from, from years past, I mean, when I got my first Tesla, it was, uh, you know, $50,000, which was crazy expensive to me. Um, but a brand new one at the time was still eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000. And that was the cheapest one you could buy. That was like the cheapest Tesla you could buy was, was in the in the realm of like 80, maybe 75 or something like that. Because uh, the Model 3 didn't exist yet. So even though mine was fifty grand, driving around, I felt like, oh, yeah. I've got a, you know, hundred thousand dollar car here. So so you know, that feeling that you get, whatever you want to call it, the 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 the, fizz. the penchant, the the lure, the whatever, the the thing they have. And then the model three comes out and you're like, I think a lot of those people that you were had this used to this like, oh, I've got the super expensive, the most advanced, blah, blah, blah. You're like, oh, now it's like thirty five grand. And like I think there definitely was like a a a, a hit mm-hmm. to that feeling. Um, just like you're saying, you know, um, a super cheap Model 3 or the Model 2 or whatever that other thing would be called uh, happened. And then the Roadster came out and it was like, nope, we're back. We're back. <laughs> we're good. <laughs> Look at that thing. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's, yeah, but it, it is an interesting question. I don't know. Would they ever create a a, a more, like, split the brands off? Like, create mm-hmm. a more, ec- a Honda to an Acura, you know, something like that. Well, on that same line, like, where would the Cybertruck fit into that? Yeah, ironically, it's the cheap one, right? Ironically, right. that's an extremely cheap vehicle for what it could do. Hmm. Despite <laughs> what Doug DeMiro, you know, says in his videos. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, I. So my vote, if it, I, here's the thing, I honestly don't expect anything from the Model Y release. I'm I'm thinking it's just going to come out exactly as advertised, but that they would quickly iterate it. Mm-hmm. You know, get the first wave of sales out, and then within a year, we'd already see a major update to it, the three, the S, and the X, all with these new Maxwell batteries or something. So I, I do wonder that that's a good. I I like that. I do wonder though because there's definitely like a. I don't know if you guys see it online or if I'm just like so deep in the weeds here on this, but there's definitely a sense of like, uh, Model Three owners having like a superiority complex to Model S and X owners as like, oh, we've got the latest and greatest. Like your guys, that thing's old and, and dated, right? Like like you right. see you see a lot of comments and a lot of sentiment like that online. I wonder what Model Y is going to be like. Right. Because if it comes out and it has, let, let's say like regardless, let's say it's the exact same range. Like you said, the specs are as advertised, but it just happens to be a new something under the hood. 
I wonder if Model mm-hmm. Y owners are going to be like, oh, you Model 3 owners with your, you know, w- w- <laughs> with those horse and buggies you're driving around. How could you even? Ugh. Like, I right. wonder if there's going to be that same sentiment in in that regard. Um, yeah, like if it has a little bit better graphics card for the, like, Netflix, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're, and they're like, how could you possibly stand to put to point your eyes at that ugly screen? Oh, like, <laughs> it's such what a, a coincidence joke. that my car is the best one. Right. <laughs> you know, yep, I, I'm not saying I'm not saying I'm better. I'm just saying I'm different in a better way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not Shout saying I'm better. I'm just saying you're worse. <laughs> right. I don't, oh, it's awesome. going to be fun to watch. I think. I think. I mean, Model Y is kind of the big story this year. If you look at like things that are we're expecting from Tesla, that's mm-hmm. kind of the big one. Um, you know, barring any other rumors or things. So, so yeah. it's, it's fun well, to get excited about it. And I don't remember where it was, but Elon. What, oh, it was maybe the Cybertruck when he announced. He was just kind of like, you know, we're not. This is our last big announcement. Yeah. You know, as in product. He said, but there'll be a few. I think he made it. Might have said surprises next year. Hmm. So I'm I'm still thinking that we're definitely going to see Maxwell batteries coming into play. And based on I haven't had a time to finish the the third row uh, podcast yet, but uh, f- shout out to them because how cool that we got five hours. Or they're going to get five hours of basically uncut footage of Elon. I mean that's awesome. Is that how long time? But, how much time they spent? Yeah, they got wow. five hours with them. Wow, yeah. Joe Rogan got one. Yeah, <laughs> no, Joe Rogan got two, one, didn't he? One or and a half. Still. But something that's like, incredible yeah it's amazing and it's it's amazing how does elon and I can't have five you... hours to spare it was i don't have five weekend. hours to spare <laughs> see there's this thing that joe that happens when you get to his level that you get to choose whatever the hell you want to do mm. <laughs> you know the exception of like yeah. going to court over a tweet there, there are like things <laughs> that you, you know yeah, I'm going to go watch the launch or I'm not. I get to say what I want to do, you know? Yeah. In fact, hey, guys, can you hold the launch until I get there? Thanks. <laughs> Which of my billion-dollar companies do I want to work on today? Right. That's what you get hey. to do. Hey, International Space Station, can you not orbit for, like, two more orbits just so I can, like, just make it there yeah. to see the launch? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's cool. I, I like the idea of, uh, yeah, I really like the idea of there being some small change or or not small change, but I can't wait. I'm excited. I hope that we learn more at the. Oh, and I also, for the record, I do want to say I could actually see them really shocking us by starting to deliver in February. Right. I know you don't think that. I'll, I'll bet you a hundred push-ups. Can do they have to be simultaneous or? Like in in a, in one sitting in a video posted on Twitter. Posted on Twitter, even. Mm-hmm. I've done it so multiple it, times with people. Yeah. In in. <laughs> Is is that how you Are get buff? You just like make a lot of bets <laughs> for for push-ups? And he keeps losing. Yeah, 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 yeah. He keeps losing. <laughs> he keeps losing. Yeah. <laughs> Starliner's going uh, up next month. Let's do it. Either way, <laughs> I win. <laughs> yeah. Um. I mean, I yeah. I don't know. I don't know if I believe my own oh, thing enough. But see? I bet by I bet in March. <laughs> I'll bet in March that we have. I'll take that. You'll take Mar. You'll take March. And what are we defining as deliveries? Customers, not employees. Customers, not employees. Deliver it, beginning to deliver in March. Yep. Okay. Okay, you heard it here, folks. 100, 100 push-up bet. Now, he may be crossing his fingers. We can't see him. That's true. So That's true. Has to be in March to a customer. That is, that is not an employee. So, like, if Elon gets yep. one, doesn't count. Okay? Right, right <laughs> You know, right. whatever. Okay. okay. I, I'm guessing May. I mean, do we want to do it both ways? It's either March or not, or is it March or May? So then if April, um, we both have to do push-ups. No. <laughs> March or not. Okay. 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 I'll take that bet. Um, what before well, we March or sooner, because if it, if it happens before, then okay. I, I definitely, then you have to do 200. Fine. So there you go. Fine. All right. I'm in. Uh, so <laughs> one thing about Elon's thing there and getting to do what he wants also is that the whole stock thing getting back to that you know what we started with here um <laughs> if you guys recall there was like this really wild bonus structure that he that they had set up for him oh yeah uh so now that the stock is uh well let's check in again um 571 uh if almost 572 now according to the new york times 
uh, if the market capitalization remains above 100 billion, which by the way makes them the most valuable U.S. automaker, which is really cool. <laughs> I I still think they're like light years behind Volkswagen and Toyota yeah. globally. But point being, well, how cool is that? A quarter a, a quarter of Toyota, but that's nothing. Or half of Toyota because Toyota was 200 billion. Yeah. So that's nothing to shake a stick at. Right. No, that's that's incredible. Um, it, okay, if the market market cap remains above 100 billion on average over a six month period, including including at least 30 consecutive days, Mr. Musk will have the option to buy 1.69 million shares at 350 dollars each. So why would you do that? So these are known as stock options. Um, you would basically, you know, that payout if they remain up there will be worth 370 million dollars. Uh, before taxes, so that would be yeah, 370 million minus taxes, so you know, 100 million maybe left. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that doesn't actually seem like that much when. Well, when, that doesn't seem like that much when your current s when your current net worth is estimated to be 32 billion. Yeah. Right. Well, you know what's it's funny that about much. that? It's like 32 billion on paper, right? Yeah. Clearly, yeah. Well, everything's on paper. Yeah. Like, clearly, you know, he doesn't have to worry about money. His kids, no one will ever have to be worry about money that are in his orbit. Um, <laughs> but uh, it will, you know, yeah. Like, he couldn't just go out and say, you know what, forget it. I'm selling 100% of my Tesla shares. Like, he, he legally can't do that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, anyways, yeah. So, yeah. It's, it's nothing shaky. I mean, I would take $370 million before taxes. I would do that. You know, oh, before taxes? You. Well... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let me relocate to the Cayman Islands or uh, Switzerland or something. <laughs> For those of you just listening and couldn't see Joe's face during that, Joe's been making some great faces today, and I'm very happy about it. As, well, as Joe, I'm scratching my lip. <laughs> Joe, why don't you just make faces all the time? Because why don't we just do it? Why don't we just? Um, okay, so here's what I did today. So I put out a thing this morning asking, or was it last night? Anyway, asking for some, uh, why don't they just, and um, here's what I decided to do because seriously, and to everybody who on Twitter, I didn't even actually tag you guys. So these were all just my people. So, whoops. But um, I got a lot of fantastic questions and I couldn't pick any of them or I couldn't pick which one I wanted. So I basically was like, all right, whichever one got the most likes, I'm going to pick that one. So that, that was a criteria. I, I left it up to fate. Actually, I left it up to Twitter. And, uh, same, same. It, it's a, it's a supernatural force. And this is what, uh, this is what kind of settled. Where did it go? Hang on. Let me find it. Here we go. Um, it's kind of random, but let's go for it. Why not? Yeah. 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 See. Yeah. So why don't they just implement the four day work week? This is from oh. Gift Horse Dentist, and he asks if he's doing it right. I guess he's doing it all right. And we did have an interesting response here from Austin Falls, who says that his squadron just got introduced to that last week. Uh, so it's been nice. So go Navy. We'll see how it goes. So the Navy only works four days a week, guys, apparently. Well, this one particular US squadron. Navy. So then why can't we save money on defense spending? That doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, well, I'll take this one because this is very, in no way, you guys both would have oh, a lot more knowledge on this. But to be clear, Gift Horse Dentist here that asked it has a German flag in his he does. Uh, thing. So th- yeah. in theory, I guess that maybe he's alluding, he also has a U.S. one, so maybe that's alluding to yeah. he's from mm-hmm. Germany or Europe or whatever. So there might be some, you know, so that question might make a bit more, uh, make more sense in that context. So, just for reference, I believe, is it Finland that has a four-day work week now? Um, so, for me, yeah. I, this is something I would like to see is that, you know, as, uh, like, automation and efficiencies, you know, because it used to take forever to be able to, you know, do c- certain things that now take us, that are literally instantaneous. And really, the average human, the average laborer, the average person isn't really reaping the benefits. We're just having to do mm-hmm. more. I would love to see that come around to to benefit the average person. That like, hey, maybe we're working too much. Maybe humans aren't meant to sit for forty hours in a cubicle, or you know, all these things. And 
I think I don't know what the how the economy actually handles that. I think you start getting into scary words like socialism and things like that that people well, will we should, immediately we should define what, what he means by four day work week maybe before you go on. Yeah, I believe four day work week would be a reduction from the standard five day work week, which is usually eight hours of work so per day. So like so, when he's referring to the navy and stuff, what they're talking about is four ten hour days. Oh it is? Yeah. So you work a longer oh. day. That's typically what that means. Is you work a longer day, mm-hmm. but you work less of them. So it gives you an extra day to you know be with your family, run errands. Well, I'm do glad other you stuff. defined that because I was thinking I've seen some things talking about reducing the average work time down to like thirty, basically. That, that may be a thing too, but but I, I don't know. The, what I got out of that typically when you talk about work, uh, you know, t- uh, four tens is what you would say, mm-hmm. and like in, right. in, in lots of different fields, this is super common. Like firefighters have a really interesting one where they work like. Uh, 72 hours straight and then they take like four days off so they work like overnight you know right. they sleep at the station yeah. they cook they you know things like that and then um nurses and doctors and then pilots like people there's lots of call. people right well or just like really kind of odd different yeah there's all kinds of different things but usually what you'd say is i work four tens and that means i work four right. 10 hour days and i have the fifth day off and mm-hmm. i know everyone that i know that's ever done that really likes it mm-hmm. yeah because really, at the I, end of the day, if you're working eight hours, the drive there, the drive back, there's like the, the getting ready and all that, you're you're basically working ten hours anyway. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I wonder what it would do as far as traffic. Even you know, you'd have basically mm-hmm. a, potentially a twenty percent reduction in traffic if people aren't having to drive to work five days a week as as opposed to four. I mean, I I would love to see that become a more standardized thing, and also having work days. Not just nine to five, but you know, have some shifts come in at, at seven, some shifts come in at eight. Not you know, stagger it more. So again, the roads and infrastructure mm-hmm. is is not slammed during these standardized hours. I think there'd be some efficiencies there. So, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. I, I think it's a it's an interesting question. I mean, maybe coming from like I don't know in Europe how these things are are regulated, but I'll I'll tell you one interesting bit. I, I worked for a company called. Um, Thompson Learning, uh, which you, you probably know Thompson Reuters. Mm-hmm. Um, Th- Thompson is the parent company, and they have lots of different like you know uh, branches of what they do and stuff. And uh, they were a, a Canadian company, and so Friday's uh, official policy: at noon, you're done. Day over, you're gone. You can hang out and work. You can do whatever you want. So we would always like play ping pong and like go to go out to lunch, and we'd all all bail. So they had a 35 hour. So they actually had a, a reduced amount of hours that we worked. Um, now you know, being a, an hourly contractor for them, uh, you know, I didn't like that. Didn't mean anything to me because I still needed to work 40 hours to get paid. But um, it is. I I love the idea of different modes of uh of scheduling things to reap a lot of those benefits as you mentioned tim also i think that just employees in general can benefit from this um some people work better in the morning some people really drag in the mornings Mm -hmm. you know um so i I think that like yeah having more flexible schedules and things in general is a good idea obviously for some things that doesn't work like the coffee lady out here decides when she wants to come in and set up her coffee shop or her coffee cart which if I get in here at a certain time, either coffee's there or it's not. So, you know, like Mm -hmm. things like that, like sometimes some jobs or imagine the Tesla factory, right? They've got like three shifts, three full-time shifts. So that thing is humming 24 seven, 24 hours a day. There's people coming and going, the thing, the machines making the things. So different industries, different things. Yeah. I think it's going to be hard to say like blanketly, like do that. Um, But you know, in Europe, there's also, they get like what, three months off or something like that as well in the summer. That's why you go to Europe in the summer and it's like, oh my God, it's like crazy. Everyone's not working. They're just out and about because literally the whole country's off work. So there's things like that. Whatever. Yeah. But point being, I I don't know. I'm a fan of this. I don't think it's something in the U.S. that you can like just implement though. You know, unless there's some kind of labor law now that says you have to do five days a week or something, which I don't believe there is. So, So, I mean, for me, it's kind of like, who is the they in this this question? I mean, if it's just an employer... Every every job is unique and has their own you know needs and whatnot, so it, it all depends on that. But I mean, yeah, kind of going from where you were just saying, like if if it was government policy, like a minimum wage or something like that, that you you know you can, you can only work four days a week or something. Uh, I mean, I don't see that happening in the United States, <laughs> just no. because government mandating anything, people flip out over it. So 
and I should definitely point out, uh, comrade, in our Discord, we have we have a lot of uh, a lot of European listeners and stuff, and they're probably just like screaming right. because, uh, according to comrade, EU so European Union law mandates four weeks yeah, of paid there you vacation. Yeah, so they get a month year. off. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would love again. I would love to see some of these efficiencies of the modern era be utilized and trickled down to the average yeah. person and the average family. You know, I mean, that makes a huge difference for, for health and, and, and mental health and, and family time and all that stuff. I, would, I think that would just be a total win for everyone. Yeah, the, the, only, the only argument against something like this, uh, like the government implementing something like this that, that I have, is that it can't be um, applied unilaterally. Like, it needs to be uh, for given... Uh, there need to be more criteria, right? So, for example, if in the U.S. we have something called the Warren Act, which if you want to, let's say, close down a call center with a thousand people working there, you can't just literally have people show up one day and be like, "Hey, bye, you guys are fired." It's illegal. Uh, you know, they would all sue you. You would, your mm -hmm. business would, whatever. So, the Warren Act says you have to give them like ninety days notice. You have to provide severance pay. You have to blah 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 mm -hmm. blah. There's all these like labor laws that have been established from, you know, for I don't know decades now that have, that have been developed here in the U.S. Um, but the problem or the challenge is, is uh, like imagine Tim, you, you know, and Joe, uh, and I'm in this boat too. You know, you work with contractors, right, to help with editing, maybe some research, whatever it is, right? Maybe different things. People will help film uh, from time to time, whatever it is. Well, in fact, there's even a law right now going through in California um, called AB5, which was totally meant to force Uber and companies like Uber to, to pay their people, give them benefits, to make them act like employees instead of contractors where you don't have to give them, you know, crap. You just whatever. You work when you want to work. It's your thing. But really, in reality, it doesn't work that way. Um, that, because there's not all these, like, conditions around who qualifies for that, that's like a unilateral thing. Like, I may be forced to anybody that I work with to hire them as an employee, pay employment taxes, provide benefits, et cetera, et cetera, when I, as a business, being very small, cannot afford that. Mm -hmm. So I think that because mm -hmm. the economy is so large and there's so many different like layers to it, it whatever kind of thing like this, if anything ever like this did get proposed, it would have to be very thoughtfully crafted in a way that doesn't like hurt startups or hurt freelancers you know in in that regard like that whole thing with freelancers like if you're a software developer that is a freelance you know guy doing some stuff for a company they may have to pay you as an employee now which could totally ruin like how they do business and how you do business like so i think that we it people just need to be very careful about mm -hmm. how anything like, like broad this strokes exactly because the u.s is so massive this is where like yeah you look at maybe smaller countries um, and I know the EU collectively has some big policies like that, but like you know, there's a lot of other smaller countries that have these policies that work really well. But in a in in a place you know ten times as large with a even larger, broader, diverse set of people and in, in companies, it's just it's very rare that I think you can find a common denominator that will like, oh yeah, that should work for everybody kind of a thing. So yeah. that would be my only worry about anything like that is that it would like actually hurt some businesses in some ways and then help others. Like ironically, that thing meant to force Uber to treat these people like employees, they are getting an exclusion or they're petitioning for one. So mm. so like my my guitar teacher who runs a small music studio and pays his teachers as 1099 may have to hire them as employees now. And he may just have to close his business because he couldn't afford to do it. So, you know, there, there's like, there's really like unintended consequences anytime something like that happens, you know, so. Mm -hmm. lot, lots, lots to think about. You can't just say yes, do that. That makes sense. Like, there's always a. But what about this? You know. Yeah. <laughs> so this one's not a. Why don't they just? It's. But what about this? <laughs> it's a. Just let employers figure it out on what's right for them and their people. And maybe if you want employers to do that, this is my, my opinion. If you want employers to start doing this, because maybe yeah, there's some studies about you know uh, mental health or whatever, whatever give them some incentive to do so, don't make it a law. Because that's yeah. where it gets really difficult. And and I guess maybe that's me as as more of a fan of capitalism and a free market, you know, in, in that regard. Like, I, I believe incentives are great to, to get people to do good things. Uh, but when you force people to do things is where there's there's always some harm in that. You know, it's never just purely, you know, even like the minimum wage thing, federal minimum wage is kind of like a, yeah, it, it sounds like obvious, 
but then you know it, that will become the seven dollars an hour in, in a short period of time anyways it's like the induced demand kind of a thing so i don't know that that's my view on it i think you should you should do something like this with incentives not make it a law yeah I oh, hate man. it when something seems so cut and dried and then you start looking into it and it's like, damn it, this is really hard. Like, this is really complicated because <laughs> there are, A like you said, I mean, here. I don't know that I agree with everything you're saying right there, but there are definitely, while I am in favor of regulations, there's a lot of unintended consequences that can come from those that can harm people sometimes right. more often than not. But yeah. Like, yeah. like, hey, you can't discriminate uh, against people based on like race or gender. Okay, fine. I think that's like a pretty fair one that you can say that's a law, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but then when you get or more into the minutia of like how you operate your business, which is what like a law and the days work days would be. Yeah, yeah. That's where I feel like it's just too. I don't know. Yeah, well, maybe in a small area it works, but in a broad, broad yeah. area, it's just too much. Well, that's why I was saying, like, I mean, every every employee or every business has different needs and whatnot. Like the 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 last job that I had for twelve years was a newspaper. Well, that newspaper went out every day, uh -huh. you know. <laughs> so, regardless of how many people were working and how many days of the week, you know, um, that could that could be a problem. So right, right, yeah, yeah. Good question, though. Yep. I like the discussion. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, what are you guys working on? I always start this one. I guess I'll just take it. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, yes. So y'all might find this one interesting. I'm I'm talking about algae biofuels Ooh. on Monday. Oh, yeah. Algae-based, yeah. not the been some... fryer engine or the old fryer from McDonald's biofuels. No. But I, but I do some... talk about how back when I had uh, my diesel car, one of the reasons I bought it was because I wanted to be able to do that. I wanted biodiesel. Yeah. Well, and, and also when I got it was like it, it was the mid two thousand Z's and the the oil price was through the roof and uh, and so I got this diesel car that got like sixty miles a gallon and and everybody was like mm. oh yeah you can just go collect you know uh, get go collect oil from restaurants and make your own diesel and I was like yeah I'll totally do that and then we yeah. we bought a house and I was like I'm <laughs> gonna set up my own little refinery in the backyard none of that happened but um <laughs> but anyway no the, it's 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 interesting and uh, it's taken me a lot longer to write than I would have liked I actually still haven't recorded it yet so I might do it after this yeah. or I might do it tomorrow morning but yeah yeah sweet Tim you Ben uh I've got a bunch of stuff lined up I've got on Mon or Tuesday a video about why I think maybe you mentioned this before I've had it done for a while finally getting it out there is uh why towing is a, a completely pointless way to measure a truck's worth and there's a lot of talk about yeah. this and all that yeah. and so basically looking at Cybertruck is what I'm talking about how people want to compare <coughs> Cybertruck based on its towing ability to other trucks and that's just dumb and yeah. I've got data to prove it. So that's that's mm -hmm. what that video is about. I don't know if people love it or hate it, but <laughs> it's just something I'm like, this is so stupid. And I have, and it's not just me saying the opinion side of it. It's like, look, I have data that shows this is stupid. So there's that. And then the Tesla earnings call is next week mm. as well. So that'll be a big one. Um, and then, yeah, other things, you know. Are you YouTube covering stuff. Starlink? Um. So I won't be doing a live stream for Starlink. Hold on, it's getting. I, uh, hold on. So I won't be doing an actual uh, live stream for Starlink, but I will be shooting it. Like I said, I'm excited to play around with that scope again and try uh, doing stuff like that. But I have to get my pollution video research totally done because I will be doing that speech in a week, basically a week and a half <laughs> at fully charged live. So um, that's putting some incentive to really. Uh, had to finish that up and that's something I've wanted to do for a long time but I've just had so many things going on so I'm actually like that's one of the reasons I'm going to be staying down here in Florida just to yeah. finish that up so yeah um, I, I probably won't have a, a scripted video still coming out until like middle of February at this point but uh, just kind of lots of little things here and there popping up and hopefully uh, yeah it's going to be this whole beginning of the year I have so many things I'm trying to trying to tackle and trying to take care of and and looking at a mobile studio setup because I really want to provide better coverage for some of the big events coming this year, like DM1 and um, Mars 2020 rover and, you know, all Starship and stuff like that. I'm really wanting to get like a, a mobile studio going. Just like so that's, buy uh, an old news van, you know? <laughs> like they had to figure it out. I want to be something way cooler. 
I'm not gonna do something turkey like that. <laughs> <laughs> I want it to be awesome. So that's what I, I'm working on too. So a lot more behind the scenes things for me on my end. A lot of just like time suckers, but all in preparation so that once everything's all settled and all that stuff, I'm gonna be cranking out some good content and. It'll be a year of transitioning and, and working on some, some cooler things for me. So I'm really excited about it. And I think it'll make a big difference in the long run. But the videos are going to be a little slow. So sorry. Oh, although I will be releasing hopefully in the next uh, week and a half or maybe by the time we do fully charge. I should have my video done about uh, like if, you know, making the, the telescope trackers and all that stuff. So um, hopefully that turns out to be a really cool video. And it'll be something different. It'll be a little more cool. um, behind the scenes style and, and kind of the like what would it take to make a NASA style telescope? You know, um, I, could, could you cool imagine stuff? someone, you know, cause this is, I'm sure you guys did it. You know how, how I did it. Like, how do you know what camera to buy? How do you know what light, like, how do you know all that stuff? Right. You go to YouTube obviously, mm -hmm. and you go look mm -hmm. at the people that you admire their content and see what they do. And then you realize, yeah, yeah no way I'm going to spend $50,000 on a camera body. But how funny would that be if it's like, you know, Tim's like how, Tim's guide on like how to do this. And then like five years from now, some kids watching it going, I want to do a space channel. Hmm, let me go see that. You know, and they're like, they do it. How awesome would that <laughs> right. be, man? That would be so well, rad. Well, I imagine what if it begins where we have like a total turnkey solution for telescope tracking, stuff like this, which basically my friend Scott, Ferg Scott Ferguson from Astronomy Live, who started doing this first. Uh, and has kind of hooked us up with, with some stuff, but we're trying to make it even more turnkey. Imagine if like Rocket Lab or some other rocket companies end up, uh, you know, popping in and, and buying like our solutions and stuff because it's coming up with just as good results as anything else. Like that'd just be hilarious. You just like have like a washing machine size thing you wheel out there, right? And then like yep. plug it in to power and you're done. Like I yep. just, you know, control it from a tablet and that's it. You know, it, it exactly. tracks, it does its all. Yeah, that'd be so cool. Exactly. Yep. Cool. Well, we'll see if the, if it turns out and if people like it, they might not, but I'll give it a try. Go for it. <laughs> and we'll yeah. see you in, in our, our ludicrous, ludicrous, ludicrous future. future. Hey, thanks so much for listening. If you like what we do and you want to kind of help get it out there, uh, you can give us a nice review on any of your podcast streaming platforms, whichever one you use. That kind of helps get it out there. Also, we do have a Patreon set up, uh, so you can join us there at patreon.com slash ourludicrousfuture. You can get your name in the credits. Meet a whole other group of like-minded people. It's a lot of fun. We do appreciate it. We'll see you there. <laughs>